Hey everybody, welcome to tonight's show. The year was 1941. 1941. FDR was president. We didn't know about the coronavirus. Hell, we barely had many vaccines at that time. This was a different time indeed. Let's take a look back in 1941. Folks, this is the King family playing the kicking mule for the tenor banjo lead. I went down to the Huckleberry picnic, dinner all over the ground. Skippers in the meat was nine foot deep, and a green pot walking all around. The biscuit in the oven was a bacon, was a beefsteak frying in a pan. Pretty gal sitting in the parlor, Lord God Almighty, what a hand I stand. Oh, damn you, I tell you. In regard to the Japanese attack, I will simply state that I was not surprised that treachery marked the beginning of this war. Pretty gal sitting in a parlor, Lord God Almighty, what a hand I stand. Oh, damn you, I tell you, Miss Liza, you keep cool. I ain't got time to kiss you now, I'm busy with this mule. at the door with a smile. He backed one near and he winked one eye and he kicked me a half a mile. Well, won't let you I tell you, Miss Liza, you keep cool. I ain't got time to kiss you now. I'm busy with my mule. About to team her mother-in-law This muley I'm a kicker He's got an iron back He headed over Texas railroad train And kicked it clear the track Won't a mule I tell you Well won't a mule I say Just keep your seat Miss Liza Jean And hold on to that sleigh How about it for the King family from 1941? They recorded that in 1941, and it was um, available uh, for listening. An interesting time about that time. You know, I'm very sensitive about music rights. Every song that you hear on this uh, on these on these streams, they're all royalty free. But there was actually like this big like dispute over like music rights back then. So there's a big chunk of music from 1941 that's really 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 good and doesn't have any copyright claims to them so i had a lot of i had a very nice selection of music and for some reason i chose uh kick the mule from the king family now tonight um is a is a very very special night for me because i get to crack open some bourbons um that were given to me by friends 
and one of those people are is on the show uh, very very often uh kurt colson gifted me this bottle of uh shinley bottled and bond thank you very much for that kurt um you're you're a great friend i've enjoyed getting to hang out with you and drink bourbon with you and i love the fact that we have raised so much money for uso together so thank you so much for for this beautiful gift uh from some time ago now if you all are ah kurt's one on the show tonight fantastic uh, if you all ha are drinking something special tonight I may not be able to get you on the show tonight, but I would I would like to get you on the show later on. So send me send me the bottle that you're drinking, and tell me the story uh, behind it, like who gave it to you, like why why that bottle is special to you, because I keep saying this, I keep saying this, but bourbon is really we're we're a family, you know, we're a family of people who love to sip a good drink of bourbon, and we can um, we can do that here, we can do that here now, we can do that tomorrow, we can do it the next day. And that moment where the, the bands are, are, are released and we can be in the same room together, we can toast. Now, this is my, um, when I'm tasting these, these older bourbons and everything, I like to let them, after I pour them, I like to let them sit. But more importantly, I need to calibrate my palate. Uh, you heard me say this a lot. I like calibrating my palate to make sure that it's not off. I'm sipping a little bit of Four Roses here. And it's tasting just like Four Roses is supposed to taste. So I, I picked something that wouldn't be in any way, shape, or form um, close to what we're tasting here. Now, the next one, I'm going to try I'm gonna try and get through um, the story of this next bottle without, without breaking up. Um, because this was given to me by the uh, late Dale Hamilton. If you've followed my blog, uh, you, you may recall that I wrote a uh, blog post probably about five, six years ago about Stitzel Weller's like, last person who approved labels and sent them to the federal government was battling cancer. Uh, well, he won. He beat cancer. He did not beat Parkinson's. And so we lost Dell Hamilton uh, last year, and Dell was one of my... One of my greatest sources in, in all of whiskey. The guy knew um, a lot. And, um, yeah, he, he was a very special man. And um, I'd like to share a story with you about Dale because, again, bourbon is about family. And it's about bringing those close to you together and introducing them to your actual real family. Well, Dale had me over for uh, his family's Christmas party once. And his like, I mean, his like whole like bloodline is beautiful. I'm like walking in there and I'm feeling like, oh my God, I do not belong in here. I'm like the one guy. I mean, they're like models, every one of them. They're like over here. Just, it's like, I feel like it's a Tommy Hilfiger, um, you know, shoot like one person over here. Like, hey, what's going on over here? Where's the gym? Is that over there? You know, so it's really, it was, <laughs> but they were very welcoming. But they were just beautiful people. And my son, Oscar, was probably... I want to say two and he was the type of two that was like the really uh really really terrible twos like he was the the worst of the terrible twos at this point and he kept going over into their uh closet and pulling stuff out of their closet and they were very cool about it but uh dale i helped dale kind of like with his collection he had like this enormous uh Stitzel weller collection and um, as a gift, as a thank you, he said, you can go in my collection and you can pick any bottle you want. And he told me this bottle was, was, of, the first, uh, was of the first year that Sitzel Weller was back in business. Um, I've not been able to really corroborate that, but I've been able to put it in. And here's the thing. There's always a lot of bottles around and everything. But this was between this was bottled between 1935 and 1941. Uh, my my best guess is it, it was actually bottled in 41 because I found some pretty good records of the um, I found some records uh, that would that stated that they were doing blends here. Now before I get into the tasting, we need to. Um, 
we need to discuss the 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 two juggernauts behind these brands because one is David, one is Goliath. And they kind of shaped American whiskey for what it is today, from the fact that uh, bourbon is a unique product of the United States to the fact that they changed uh, barrel entry proofs. Uh, I mean, every little step up until the 70s, you know, these two men had a hand in it. So who are they? Well, Louis Rosenstiel was this man who really became wealthy um, and he saw an opportunity for selling medicinal whiskey during Prohibition. He took advantage of it. During that time, he was acquiring distilleries and he was, he was doing that through throughout Prohibition, right as Prohibition was about to end. So when he comes out of Prohibition, he is, he's got a powerhouse at his disposal. He becomes one of the most one of the most powerful men in the entire business world. Business world, not just not just whiskey, but in all of business. One of the, the distilleries he owned was the Quaker distillery distillery in in Lawrenceburg, Indiana. Now that's often confused for the the distillery that was in, that we now know as MGP Ingredients. Um, that was owned by Seagram's. But in fact, Shinley and Seagram's were pretty tough competitors. And so this was distilled at the, this was distilled at that Indiana distillery in the 1930s and bottled in 1941. So he dies in uh, 1976 and the United Distillers acquires Shinley. United Distillers is Diageo today. But he is a man that was paramount to all of American whiskey's success. Well, the other guy, you may know him. You may have heard of him a time or two. His name is none other than Pappy Van Winkle. And let me go ahead. Oh, that's right. That's right. There he is. Pappy Van Winkle. I don't need bullet points for Pappy. Everybody knows who Pappy Van Winkle is. He's this really, he's this really important, you know, iconic distiller. But well, Rosenst Rosenstiel was like over here, like preaching about corporations. Pappy was over here, trying to protect the little guy and trying to, uh, trying to like preserve independent distillers. They're, you know. Shinley was caught up in all sorts of price fixing scandals. They were they were connected to all kinds of shenanigans that was always under investigation. And Pappy was the guy that the government would come to and said, "Hey, what's going on here? What's going on there?" Now Pappy did end up getting in some of his own problems. He had protests. He had uh, uh, he had strikes. He had a lot of issues. But the one issue he never had was his whiskey. This I would guarantee you would probably be. The one whiskey that um, that he was probably not the most proud of, and that is why I chose it when Dale offered it up as a as a gift. Is because you look right there on the bottle, and it's a little bright there, but it says it's a blend of straight whiskeys. That means that they did not have enough stocks to put out their straight bourbon at this point, and it was the um, it was all they had to put out. And so a lot of people put out these blend of straights. They're very common and popular now, but back then they were, they were not very, they were not very liked by the distillers because they would much rather have, you know, something of premium quality on the market. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to take some questions here. Take some questions while I uh, while I finish off this this four roses. I'm getting some comments here that I, the stuff is coming in pretty fuzzy. I'm trying to fix that up here. Yeah, just sipping a little four roses, calibrating that palate, going to something I know. So what's everyone drinking tonight? You got to share with me what you're drinking. 
Mm. So Glenn wants to know. Uh, Glenn wants to know, uh, did I already explain the move to this room? Uh, I actually, I did not. So the reason why, the reason why I moved over here, so this is like my sample room at my office. Uh, the reason why I moved over here, uh, twofold. One, I really wanted to stand. I got tired of sitting and talking. Uh, I, you know, it felt like my, my back was kind of like scrunched. I like standing and talking. I like using my hands. And I felt I, I would watch myself to see how my posture was. And I was found myself slot, you know, slouched over. So I really wanted to stand. And two, people kept staring at me through the windows. And it kind of, I'm not going to lie, it eventually creeped me out. And I got tired of people coming over off to the side and staring at me while I was talking to you all in the camera and sipping whiskey. So this is a room that Unless they get on their hands and knees and look through that little bitty crack in the window right there, no way they can see me. So I feel better that way. Now, someone asked, where is the ascot? I guess you all can't see it. This ascot, it's loud and proud, just tucked up a little bit underneath the shirt. Hmm. All right. Chris Haynes is having some Florida whiskey this evening. All right. from Palm Ride Reserve Rye Whiskey. I'm just going to say, I hope you're enjoying that, but they're not winning me with that brand name. I don't think of whiskey when I think of a, a Palm Ride. Mm, 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 mm. Joey's asking me, what's the coolest mini bottle I got? I don't know. I got some cool ones. Um, I have a, I used to have a lot of Cuban rum, but... Um, yeah, I drink it all. Okay. The, the palate is calibrated. I am ready to rock and roll. We're going to start. Well, actually, why don't we take a look at this? Um, let's take a look at some ads here. Oh, nope. Let's go back to this. Again, if you have not sent me your photos, make sure you send me your photos. Um... People in the chat will tell you where to send them. You just send them to assistant at fredminnick.com. And in, be in between uh, tastings, you know, when I do the bonus, um, I will I will basically, I will pick photos and I will try to put them up uh, when I get back. So make sure that you are uh, sending me your photos of what you're drinking tonight so you can hang with me on the show. So... This is a this is a really interesting point that I did um, I did a lot of research on this and and Pappy was really really big into really really big into um, marketing his whiskey. He didn't have any really any really true marketing ads for his uh, for his uh, blended whiskey. So that tells me that again, like he probably was not very proud of it. But I've had it before, and it's not bad. Whereas Shinley, Shinley, this is what they were marketing. This is the same bottle. This is the same bottle right here. Um, and uh, same exact bottle. In 1941, it wasn't selling, so they were having to discount it from 290, get that 290, to 229. Now, something very important to notice is that they would they would uh, market their whiskey as America's mildest. Think about that for a second. How would America's mildest whiskey sell today? I don't think that would sell very well. So whoever uh, whoever came up with that marketing phrase, you know, I bet they got fired. Not a good marketing plan, if you ask me. So that's just kind of a little bit of a tale of like the ads there. Now it's time to get into it, folks. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be drinking. This right here, drinking the, 
drinking the Weller. This is a blend of straights. Um, it's all four years old. They did not define what type of whiskey it was, but um, I think there's a pretty good assumption that this was probably a corn whiskey. This was probably a bourbon. Uh, I very, I'm very doubtful that you would have a rye in there because most of the rye was coming from like Pennsylvania, and they um, they were not fans of you know. Pappy was not a fan of Pennsylvania rye, so. I have a hard time believing that he would. Oh, man. Mm. Man, that, you know, it smells really good. Cherries, a lot of cherries. It doesn't have like that. So Dusty's have a tendency to be, you know, taste like you're like a molded piece of wood. You know, they don't always it's like a dankness. Just it's just not a pleasant flavor. This is uh, kind of a cherry syrup. Um Kind of like the, not quite Robitussin, but some of those cherry cough syrups you smell. And then, um, like honey. Honey. Mm. Well, man. Yeah, it tastes like... Um, Robitussin. Ugh. Oh boy. Yep. This uh this whiskey, you know, for the time, black licorice, cherry cough syrup. I mean, those are things that people liked to eat back then. So this might actually have rye in it because there's so much licorice in there. Now, I've tasted this before, and usually not in kind of an analytical setting. So this is probably the first time that I've tried to break this one down. It comes in the palate, um, you know, very, you know, very liquidy. That sounds weird, but it doesn't really feel like alcohol in the palate. It feels like um, just like a liquid. And then, and then it, then it kind of comes to uh, the back palate, and then that's when it starts to feel like alcohol. Um, and then you get that cherry cough syrup, you get the licorice, um, and a couple other things. But I'm not quite sure what they are, but it's it's very. I'm gonna have to go to my four roses to recalibrate. Hmm. Uh, Shim asked a good question here. He wants to remember the uh, proof of the um, of the whiskey. Now you have to remember that uh, they didn't put the the labels were very different back then. Like today, everything's on the front. Uh, back then, they would put a lot of those details on the on the back. So it is eighty six proof. That's another way you know that uh, they didn't really um, admire this bottle. Is that you didn't see a lot of things bottled at 86 proof back then. Okay. So here we go. Folks, that's uh, Alan Bishop. He's uh, he's an Indiana distiller. You may remember him from, um, um, from the episode in which I uh, picked his uh, bourbon over Evan Williams' uh, Bottled and Bond. And um, really fantastic distiller, making great brandy out there at uh, French Lake. So make sure you give uh, Alan some love, huh? Go check out uh, Spirits of French Lake. In fact, I've got something I'll be announcing here pretty soon about an effort to try and help craft distillers. But, um, you know, this is going to be this one here. 
now that we get into now that we get into the Shinley, I want I want you to listen to the people who tasted this. Uh, they called themselves the Quality Control Board. Okay, A. B. Blanton, all right, of Frankfort, Kentucky. Anybody ever heard of the name Blanton? Anybody? Robert Nance. He was the master distiller at uh, at the Lawrenceburg, Indiana distillery. W. R. Nebelkamp. Now Nebelkamp was a distiller, and they would he would later be president of Churchill Downs. But they all three signed it on the back there. Now I don't know if this was like like done in like ink or whatever, but I, I still think that's pretty cool. It's like a murderer's row, and, and I just love. I love this old bottle. I like seeing that kind of like engraving. There's not a lot of distillers that do this well now, um, but I, I really dig this bottle. And that cork has stood the test of time. Woo, man. Now, as you may recall, I've tasted this once before on an episode. And I did the mouthgasm thing where I crawled back and was like, ooh, I be be. And so this is my this is my second or third time to approach it. I I think I made the mistake of leaving the original cork in. I probably should have replaced the cork the moment I opened it. It smells literally, it smells like dust. Oh, damn. Oh, yeah. That kept. Mm. Man, that's good. That that That's good in the way that you want. I, I, this is what I want whiskey today to taste like. Mm. Ah, caramel. Just so up front. Caramel, caramel, caramel. And the thing is... That was not necessarily a, a, a dominant note back then. The grains were different. The water was different. The wood they used was different. The distilling techniques were different. You know, they didn't... You know, I, I don't really know how they distilled at the old Quaker distillery. But, you know, Shinley was Shinley was kind of ahead of its time with a lot of the um, scientific approaches. So, I mean, this could have been like a place where they would have uh, experimented with new styles of yeast you know we may have like a special yeast in here mm. i mean shinley was a great company they did such so much good work and i dare say that um you know the whiskey world was hurt um when that man passed away but he did have a passion for American whiskey. Good Lord. So it feels like velvet. I mean, it's like velvet on my tongue. Just like a velvet glove just coming in there and grabbing it. And then underneath that, just like dripping down like all sorts of sweet goodness. Now, what's interesting about this sweet goodness, I can't really break it down and define it like I, like I normally would. These are not flavors that I, I typically entertain, and they're hitting me on the sides of my palate. So I'm getting like a lot of, uh, lot of flavor on the sides of my tongue. Now, that, that happens sometimes, but usually I'm able to kind of like figure it out. But as I, as I play with this a little bit more, I mean, I'm getting like like a, a lot of like uh, bush fruit, like uh, raspberries, like really like like almost almost about to go bad raspberries where they're they're sweet and mushy and they just kind of really just uh, get a certain structure on your tongue and like blackberries and like blueberries. But there's something else there that I just I don't quite know. I don't quite know what that is. And I hate that. Mm. 
Now, I will admit that I probably need new glasses because when Alan wrote, uh, as a Hoosier, I'd like to see the resurrection of Old Quaker, I originally thought he said, as a hooker, I would like to see the resurrection of Old Quaker. And I'm thinking to myself, Alan, I thought you were a really good distiller, but I mean, hey, we all got to do what we got to do. And um, yeah, I need new glasses, but unfortunately, I can't go get new glasses. So I'm going to go back into the Weller. This is the W.L. Weller, uh, distilled uh, in the 1930s, I believe bottled in 41. Okay, maybe uh, maybe this needed to open it up and have a little swirl around. and Because it's definitely a different whiskey on the nose. Now it's a lot more like leather. Now it's a, more, a lot more like... Um, a little bit of like a kind of a masculine soap where you got um it smells just a it smells like a touch like uh like brute cologne um and then there's a sandalwood so the nose has definitely opened up for me definitely opened up christopher nelson yes musk 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 for men i remember watching those commercials as a kid thinking if i put on musk cologne i'd be a man but then i would get a couple dabs of it and that shit burned damn that shit burned mm. all right the palate still sucks but it's got like the, the nose got better, uh, but it still is like it, it's like over overly black licorice, cough syrup, and you know, you know, throw in something else that isn't isn't very appealing, and that's what the uh, that Weller is. Now, let's go back to the. Let's go back to the Shinley. Back to the Shinley. Distilled in Indiana. Tasted by the great Mr. Blanton. Albert Blanton. Well, this is an easy victory tonight, folks. I'm going to pick it pretty easily this is the um, um, I'm really really sad to say that Willer does stink tonight did not hit the palate right um, and my good friend Dale Hamilton whom gave me this bottle would not want me to sugarcoat it so it is what it is but uh, this Shinley though it's money Uh, Kurt asks if I get any uh, cherry cherry notes tonight. Um, I got cherry cough syrup in the Weller. With this one, I get a lot of a uh, lot of fruits. Um, to me, it's been black fruit, maybe maybe a dark cherry. Mm -mm. All right, so for tonight's bonus tasting. I got a new shipment of of um, of new riff in, and I thought I would taste that for you guys, if you're down for it. If you want me to call it a night and pack it up and go home, I could probably sit down on the couch and eat a pop tart and let it go straight to my hips. So, you all let me know if you would like to see me taste a little bit of. Um, a little bit of new riff, the new new riff that's out. Uh, Christopher Nelson asked, "Is your whiskey collection insured?" Now, Christopher Nelson, the thing about insuring your whiskey is, it's not very valuable if it's open. If you take a look in this room, if you go to my house, 
you're not going to find very many bottles that aren't open. And uh, a lot of these come to me as gifts. Some of them are sample bottles. And believe me, I buy a boatload of it. But I have no intention of, um, of not drinking it with, with friends and family. And I guess I never really thought of about it, about insuring it. But um, if I were to do it, I do know there is a state farm rep around Louisville who does that sort of thing. It's, um, it's the sort of thing that I should probably think about a little bit more. But it looks like the consensus is, and is basically what Graham is saying here, to go get some new riff. All right, I'm going to do it. Now, let's see. What kind of music you guys want to hear? Let me get you guys some good music on here. T E M V T E D T E Thank you for for hanging out with me. I went ahead and got the uh, the new riff samples. New riff uh, sample only. Two hundred milliliter backsetter peated backset bourbon whiskey. I don't know much about these or how they were made. Um, there might actually even be an embargo on them, but I didn't really pay attention to that. Like, if you send me a sample, I mean, I'm not going to read anything you write. You put it in there, I'm just pulling it out, and I'm either going to drink it or it's going to go on the shelf to be sipped later. So, so uh, looks like we have two samples of the Backsetter Peated Rye. Oh, no, one's a, one's a rye, one's a bourbon. Okay, so there we go. These are samples in obvious sample bottles. Not for sale. Um, I think peated bourbons, you know, that's a dangerous combo because bourbon consumers don't necessarily like Pete. Carla Carlton, you know, incredible writer, manager, managing editor for Bourbon Plus. She... Um, she thinks Pete tastes like Band-Aids. So I think it's risky, really, really risky to um, to do a Pete with bourbon. The only only company I've seen do it well is Kings County out of, uh, out of New York. And that was by mistake. So we're going to start with the Pete of bourbon from New Riff. It's funny. Uh, <laughs> I, I I feel like I'm smelling musk, and I I just I don't know if maybe these uh, these vintage pours like um, 
did a number on me. I did move the uh, the vintage pours, right? Yeah, you know what? I just want to make sure, like, I didn't pour that in the wrong glass or something. Yeah, I did. I moved them over here. Yeah, so there's no way that's it. So that's okay. Got to be honest, man. This nose is not appealing at all. It smells like um, it smells like a hot pavement. Like you're walking, like it's like really, really freaking hot outside, and the asphalt's really hot, and like that, it starts like the chemically smell coming off the pavement. If it's so hot, you can like see fumes coming up in the air. That's initially what this smells like to me. It was like an asphalt smell. Yeah, oh, boy, I hope this palette makes up for that nose because that nose says not drinking it. Oh God, oh God, no, God, no, no. I love New Riff, but this is awful. Ugh. That tastes like that tastes like um, wow. That tastes like a like a spit cup or like an overly like it's so it, it no it's just like tobacco overly tobacco. In fact, I'm actually gonna pour some new rip I like to rinse my mouth out. Because I'm going to go into the rye. And if I go into... If I go into that with that friggin' palette... I mean... I mean, maybe maybe what they did there works on the rye. I mean, I don't know. But that... Um, maybe I had a flawed bottle. I don't know. But I know what I tasted there. That was like overly tobacco. It smelled like asphalt going in. I don't... It just... I would not recommend that. And ordinarily, I tell you that I, I do things three tries, but I, when you know, you know. Okay, so this is, uh, I'm actually tasting the Bottle and Bond uh, Balboa Rye, the Kentucky Straight Rye from New Riff. All right. That's great. Really good. Really good front of the palate action. Back of the palate spice, middle of the pal middle of the palate savoriness. Um, yeah. All right, so yeah, that so I'm just kind of kind of recalibrating my palate before I go in to taste the uh, the new riff uh, back setter peated back set rye whiskey. But given my experience on the on the bourbon, I don't know if I'm that enthused to give it a shot, but I will do it. Okay, this is more approachable. This is, this is way more approachable way more approachable than the bourbon. This is, um, this has a lot of fall smells to it. Like there's like a, I feel like I'm walking into Hallmark with their fall candles, like various sages and pumpkin spice, spe pumpkin spice smells. Hmm. Oh God, no! Ugh. Oh, I, I don't know. No, no. Look, if you like tobacco, oh, oh my God! 
Mm. Oh boy. Yeah. I really love I really love what New Riff is doing. Uh, this is a miss. Um, I'm a big fan of basically all the releases up into this. Um, this is not a good meld. It's not a good fit. I don't think that the Pete came across in a way that someone who likes Scotch would like it, and I don't think it came in a way it came in a way that someone who likes bourbon would like it. So, but if you are someone who really, if you chew tobacco, I mean, I think you might like this. If you like the flavor of tobacco, you might actually really, really like this. I did chew tobacco. I did chew tobacco for a very, very long time. Um, I quit in 2005. At that time, I might, I might like this. If, um, you know, if you like chew on your cigars, you might like this, but I don't chew on them. I smoke them. So I'm, I'm not going to be able to recommend those uh, for sure. But um, it is, that's how it rolls though. You know, I'm honest. I'm an honest reviewer. And um, sometimes that happens. So now I need to go and check out who has sent me photos of themselves tasting whiskey. I know, Doug. I know. I do love them. But here's the thing. They would not want me to, you know, to, to say that I like something just because, you know, I'm friends with them. I can't do that. That's a good thing. To, that's a good way to point, put it out there. Ooh. Man, someone's dropping some... Uh, Someone's dropping some heat tonight. Let's, all right. Let's take. I'm gonna put on some music, guys. While I'm, um, while I'm finding these, I'm putting up these uh, various, um, these various uh, bottle shots. But Corey Corey Green comes in smoking hot. He just uh, he just posted this. So, guys, check this out. Corey Green is packing some heat tonight. If I can freaking get to it. There he is. There's Corey Green. Look at that. Look at Corey Green go. Man, Corey Green is bringing it tonight. Look at that. Look at that bottle. Now, I've had that before. Don't get me wrong. It's nice. But it's one of those that people don't actually normally drink. They just kind of... They kind of just stick it there and and have it in their library and not, and not drink it. So I'm glad to see Corey busting that open. How about it, guys, for Corey? How about it? Woo, Corey, yay! guys go to assistant at fredminnick.com we're gonna make this look good now i am a one-man show tonight so cut me some slack oh look at that my former uh, fedex man i miss you glenn
So tonight's uh, winner for really, I don't have anything to give away. I guess maybe a sticker, but I know already, he already has one of those. Uh, it's going to go to Matthew Gore breaking out one of the very first uh, uh, releases back into the United States market of, um, of Four Roses. If I looked at that bottle correctly, which it was a very flash look, uh, that did look like one of the first bottles to come back into the market from, um, you know, when they came back in 1996 through the 97, 98, 99, 2000. So huge win for you, Matthew Gore. Always appreciate you guys sending those in. You can send them in uh, throughout the week. I will try to get you all on the show no matter what, and you, no one told me that. I was uh, all up on my logo there. But um, you guys can totally send those photos in anytime, and I will be more than happy to try and get you up on the show. I'd love to... I, I love this dynamic. I love, I love getting the photos, putting them up there, playing music to them. It's, it's great for me. I love it. I love all this. You guys are awesome, and I just, I just feel like I feel like this is a time where you know whiskey drinkers, maybe we call ourselves sippers, whiskey sippers. Um, you know, we can come together and um, have a good dram. You know. Oh God, that was the wrong one. I grabbed the wrong one. Okay, that was not the right one either. You know, listen, I'm gonna pour myself a fresh glass. There's too many. There's too many um, there's too many mines here. I can't take a chance. I'm grabbing the wrong one. Uh, so I'm going to grab what is probably my favorite bottle in this whole thing and um, and then we will and then you will know but um, I can't really find it. Somebody mentioned that um, I have a lot of barrel bourbons. Those guys do a release, I feel like, every five days. So you know, this is kind of like the barrel bourbon section. But my God, you know, Joe Beatrice is always doing something. Um, what have I tasted in the last few days that really kind of made me, made my day? A lot of good ones here. What bottle will it be? Hmm. 
Ah. This bottle of Uncle Nearest is the shit. All right, everybody. Well, thank you all so much. Oh, is there a Rua behind me? Oh, damn. Somebody brought up Rua. Taste off between Uncle Nearest and Rua. Here we go. We'll do the we'll do the barrel pick of uh, seal box versus Uncle Nearest. Now, Uncle Nearest is not eligible for my whiskey of the year. Not this bottle, anyway. I do enjoy me some 291. 291 is a fine bourbon. They do a really good job out there. Actually, I just sent one to uh, Johnny Christ from Avenge Sevenfold. We're going to be doing a. Um, I'm going to be doing a, um, a, a a live tasting with uh, Avenge Sevenfold's bassist. Also, since you all are like my most like loyal friends, actually. What do I call you all? YouTubers? Commenters? So, not this Friday, but next Friday, May 1st. You guys are hearing it first. I've got a huge interview with an artist. Enormous. Anyone ever heard of a little band called Fleetwood Mac? Bourbon tubers, I like that. Oh yeah. Mm. That roux is so good. But mm. <laughs> I love it. We I'm gonna call you my barflies. I like that. Mmm. Oh, so I didn't pick the bottle of Uncle Nearest. I thought this was I thought this was a single barrel pick. It's just a standard Uncle Nearest. So I am uh, I am going to pick in the in the uh, bonus bonus round the encore round. I'm going to pick Rua. I really really love this whiskey. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. All right, everybody. Thank you all so much for joining me. Please grab the whiskey that you have near you. Bring it to your 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 thing and let's all let's all share in a toast together. We are here. We'll be here tomorrow. We have a whiskey in our hand and we are here together. Cheers everybody. Please do not lick handrails. Don't lick trash cans. And remember, vodka sucks unless it's being used for hand sanitizer. Cheers. Be safe, everyone. Stop buying 